Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome back to the Camel Trophy. We're here in Arnhem, the Netherlands, and we're going to look at a match between a Dead Guy Ale deck. So that's black and white. We've got Jews and Jins. The deck is piloted by Kuhn, and he is taking on the organizer of the tournament, Bjorn, and he's playing Urnum on Ice. So these are two really strong decks going face to face. Now, before I start with the match, I'm first going to do a little deck tech. I've got beautiful deck photos of both of these decks. But I know that some of you want to skip and go right to the action. The easiest way to do that is by checking out the description below because there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. If you click on there, it will take you straight to the games. And also you can find information about the rule set of this tournament in the description below. I can already tell you that we are playing according to the gentleman's rules, which means no mind twist and no library of Alexandria are played at this tournament. Okay, now that you're informed, we are going to start with the deck deck. I think I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna start with the deck of Kuhn, the dead guy ale player. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Kuhn. So it's black and it's white. And I think what makes these decks so strong is that white is such a great color to have as a second color because you only need a little bit of white mana, right? You've got your Disenchant, only one white in casting, your Balance, only one white, your Swords of is only one white. And white offers you the best removal spells in old school. The thing is, I, I, I play with blue a lot, right? And blue is great, but with blue, you need to counter. And counter can be quite hard. You need to know when to time, you need to know when to do it. With white, you simply, you draw your solution. Okay, it is a one for one trade, but it is instant speed. It's cheap to cast. It, it is just great. And I think a lot of players that have started playing with white find it difficult to stop playing with white because of that control package that we see here in the deck of Kuhn. It's just, you have your, your, your Swiss army knife in your deck as to speak, which is quite nice. And then you've got black, which is actually a strong color, but you need some commitment to black. If you look at the casting cost, right? We have Juzum Jin double black, Hypnotic Spectre, Black Knight also require double black in their casting cost. We've got Underworld Dreams, which requires a triple black. Right, so you do need some commitment to black, and again, this is great to combine with, uh, with of course, with those white spells in the deck, because they only cost one white to cast. We also see sinkholes here, and I think the combination of sinkhole and dark ritual is another thing I really like, because that can get you ahead on tempo. If you can sinkhole your opponent, and then at the right time use your dark rituals or use your dark rituals before that to kind of get an early hypnotic specter or an early Jusum Jin, you can really get ahead of the game, and your opponent has to answer these big threats, because if your opponent doesn't, with Hypnotic Spectre, it means card disadvantage, and with Juzum, it simply means you die, because it's five power. You cannot keep taking five damage a turn. You can do that for four turns, and then you're dead, right? So with this deck, you can build up pressure very quickly. Of course, there's always a danger pl uh, when playing with Dark Ritual. That's that you're setting yourself up for a potential two for one, right? You use your Ritual, for example, to do your traditional play, Dark Ritual Hippie turn one, which sounds great, but what if your opponent has a Bolt, or in this matchup of Swords to Plowshares, then you've lost two cards and your opponent only one. So you really need to know how to time that. Um, another thing, another card I really like in this matchup is uh, Underworld Dreams. So Underworld Dreams kind of punishes players who play with blue because blue players usually want to draw cards with Ancestral Recall, Brain Geyser, you know, they tend to play more controlling with Gem Day Tomes. Your Underworld Dreams is going to punish your opponent for wanting to draw those cards. All of a sudden, Ancestral Recall is going to deal three damage to them. It's still a great card, don't get me wrong. I mean, three cards for three damage, of course you're going to do that. But in combination of having that pressure, you know, having a low life total already, and then going to draw those extra cards, that's going to make it, you know, extra difficult, especially if you want to, like, if you're midway to game, you're under pressure, and you're like, okay, I need to play this big brain geyser to get a new hand and try to find some answers. But if I do, I'm gonna take like six, six damage, and I'm already like, I don't know, on five or lower maybe even, so you cannot do that. So I, I really like Underworld Dreams as this counter card for these card drawing control decks. So I think that's, uh, that's really good. So this is the deck of Kuhn. Maybe you recognize this deck, by the way, because we also had this uh, same deck at the Raging Bulls series, the other tournament that uh, we broadcasted here on Timmy Talk. So that was a really cool match where it played against a robots deck. So you probably remember it from that matchup. If not, after this match, you take a moment and, and look it up on the channel. It's quite spectacular. But this is the deck of Kuhn. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Bjorn. And here we see the deck of Bjorn. So it's Urnum on Ice, right? I've played against this deck a lot. I know the deck very well. And it's always interesting to see the different decisions that some players make, the different tweaks. For example, this deck has three Sarah Angels, where most builds that I've played against only had two Sarah Angels. It also has four Urnums instead of three Urnums. We see only one Sylvan. Most people play with two Sylvans. So these little tweaks 
can make differences. I, I think when I'm looking at the list overall, I think there's a little bit more beef in this deck in the forms of the Urnums and the Sarah Angels and a little bit less smaller creatures. We do see, of course, some Lanara Elves, I believe three Lanara Elves, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think it's a full playset. Now, what makes this deck so strong is it's got a lot of different components. Um, this deck has a lot of threats, right, in the form of Urnum and Sarah Angel. So it's got some beef. It also has a lot of answers in the form of that wide control package, short Plowsiers, Disenchants, the balance. And then on top of that, it also has a land removal to play Temple, right? Uh, your Ice Storms are going to give you a Temple advantage together with your Mana Dorks and your Moxen. So it's got threats, it's got answers, it's got Temple. And then on top of that, it's got the blue package to give it card draw. Right, because basically there's not really blue in this deck. You know, there, there are the usual blue suspects in this deck, which is Brain Geyser and the three power cards. And they're being played a lot for a reason because they can refill your hand. It's great if Bjorn can play and he can he can win it on tempo and he can win it on threats and he can have answers. But at a certain point, his hand will be empty, and that's where that blue component comes in. It's so important. The Brain Geysers, the Time Twister, it's going to give you a whole new hand. It's also going to shuffle back those answers in your in your deck, which is quite nice. And um, he's also playing with Sylvan Library and Gem Day Tome. Of course, those are two other ways to uh, to get some card draw going as well. So, it, you know, it's a very strong deck. It's a very competitive deck. And uh, you can usually find decks like this in the top of the standings at old school tournaments. So I'm sure this deck is doing very well here at the Camel Trophy as well. So now that we've discussed both of these decks, it means it's time. We're going to go to the match. Let's take a look at Kuhn versus Bjorn. Let's go. Game number one, here we go. So we have Kuhn sitting on the left. It looks like he's taking a mulligan. He's playing the Dead Guy L deck, black and white, and Bjorn on the right, who's playing Urnum on ice. So blue, green, and white. Starting here with a Swamp, playing a Dark Ritual into an Underworld Dreams. I think this is a great decision. Some early pressure. So Bjorn is going to take some early hits here. Going to go to 19, drawing the first card. And I think it's good, you know. The thing is, though, that Kuhn, of course, took a mulligan as well. So now he's started with six. So now he's on only three cards. So if Bjorn can answer this with like an early disenchant. Ooh, are we going to see an early threat? Cracking the Lotus. There's an Urnam turn one. This is quite an explosive start of this duel. That Urnam on board. Now let's hope for Kuhn that he has a sword. He is playing out a white source. There's a source to plowshares. Does mean for life, of course, for Bjorn. So he's going to go up to 23. So uh, that's, uh, that's something. Of course, he's going to take a damage as well. I believe he should take an extra life, but maybe I'm mistaken. Anyway, there's a Lanara Elves in a past turn. There is a Scrubland and a pass. So no Hypnotic Spectre, for example. There's another damage, so Bjorn is now back on 20, it seems. Going to play a City of Brass. Tapping 3 for an Ice Storm, probably. So Ice Storm on the Scrubland. And there Kuhn goes again, finding another Scrubland. He's going to tap 2 there. Okay, he's going to play a Chaos Orb. And this is interesting, right? Because I don't really see a target for him yet. Ooh, there we see an Ancestral Recall. So now some of the pain is going to start like three points of damage. I mean, it's still worth drawing three cards, of course, but at least it's 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 something that Underworld Dreams does against these card drawing decks. What I wanted to say is he's playing the Chaos Orb now. There wasn't really a target for it, which is kind of risky because he's offering Bjorn a moment now to, to get his Disenchant ready and to kind of wait for the activation of Kun, of the Chaos Orb. But he's going to tap four, playing an Urnum, and now he's attacking. Interesting. Perhaps I would have kept the uh, Lanower Elves untapped to kind of pretend to have uh, a Disenchant in hand. And there we see a flip on the Urnum here by Kuhn. So is he going to hit it? Yep, he is going to hit it. That went quite fast, by the way. So a quick flip here by Kuhn. Taking care of the threat. And it's hard to see Kuhn's life total, but I believe he's still on 19. I'm going to try to keep track of it for you guys. And uh, I think Bjorn is on 15. Now he's going to go to 14. And he's going to draw a card. And a pay one. There is a soul ring. Ooh, 
Is he going to play out another threat? He still has some Sarah Angels in the deck. Already lost two Urnums, of course. Can also just attack. Yeah, exactly. So he has animated the factory, it seems. There's a Disenchant on the factory. And there's another damage for Kuhn. So he's going to drop to 18. There's another Urnum. So he's finding a lot of these Urnums. This is Urnum number three out of the four in his deck. That is a bit unfortunate for, for Kuhn having to deal with these threats. What he needs is a land and a Juzam. That would be ideal for him. Instead, all he can do is just pass turn. So Bjorn going to 13 after drawing the card. And now he can deal 5 points of damage. Putting Kuhn on 13. So Kuhn is now on 13. There's a Chaos Orb. Ooh, this, he's losing grip of the game. There's another Lanawar. If I was Bjorn, I wouldn't even use it now on the Underworld. I would just wait for maybe Kuhn to play a Juzem as a blocker and then take care of the blocker. And Bjorn is really winning it here on that Ancestral Recall and also on finding so many Urnums. There are just too many problems for Kuhn. And remember, Kuhn had to take a Mulligan in turn one, so he already started with one card less and he had that explosive opening with Ritual Dreams, but that set him back two more cards as well. And that is, that is the tough thing about, I guess, his... His dead guy ale deck. There's of course not a lot of card draw in it. There's actually zero card draw in it. So so that makes it difficult to come back. You know when you when you're behind on card advantage. He's going through his hand trying to find a solution. And he's on thirteen, so he's going to take some serious damage on the end step. I think we're going to see chaos orb disenchant in response to chaos orb. So at least the Underworld Dream stays on the board, that's something. Or maybe he wanted to target a land, by the way. Because I'm sure he knows that Kuhn plays with Juzams. So you don't want him to get too far. Attacking for 6, that means he's going to drop to 7. Yes, yeah, so he's dropping to 7 right now. We can't see his life total, but he is on 7. Bjorn is on, I believe, 12 right now, after taking the damage from the Dreams. And now he really needs to find a Swords... Soul Ring. I was hoping for a Swords there. Soul Ring into Juzam would be nice as well. Are we going to see a Juzam? There is the Juzam. And now let's hope for Kuhn that Bjorn doesn't have an answer. There's a Swords though. Does mean 5 life. So he's going to go back up to 12. That is something. And uh, Bjorn is going to drop to 11. So Kuhn is back on 12. He's going to take 6. So he's going to drop down to 6. So from 12 to 6. And he's dead next turn if he doesn't find another answer. And I mean, I just felt like Kuhn Lee needed a little bit more luck in this game one exactly. Because now it's over. Bjorn taking this first game. That Ancestral Recall and all those Urdoms were just too much for Kuhn's deck to deal with. Now both players are going to dive into their sideboards. And we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two. Here we go. So it's one game up for Bjorn, the player on the right side. That means that Kuhn is on the play here. He hasn't taken a mulligan, so that's good news at least. Starting with the City of Brass and a pass. There is a Savannah by Bjorn. So both players have been quite a slow start. They're not ramping up or anything. No Lunar Elves, no Moxen, no Dark Rituals. There is a Plains. Interesting. Does that mean that Kuhn doesn't have access to Swamps? You would expect him here to perhaps play a Swamp. Sinkhole would have been a great move now, but he can't. He doesn't have double black. And passes the turn. There's a Tropical Island. Ooh, Whirling Dervish. So this card comes from the sideboard. It's a 1-1 protection from black. Quick sorts to Plowsiers though. And I think that's very important. Take care of business here. That means that Bjorn is going up to 21. And every time the Whirling Dervish deals damage, it gets a plus 1, plus 1 counter. So it can get out of hand quite quick. And of course, it's great against uh, the Juzams and all the other black creatures in the deck of Kuhn. And look at that. There's a Maze of If. And another Whirling Dervish. And it looks like Kuhn has missed a land drop. That is very unfortunate for Kuhn. He needs to find a Swamp too. Black is quite important. Finds a Factory instead. Oh, that is not great. So Kuhn is not finding the lands he needs. Already missed a land drop. Should be on four lands here. And if his deck is working on full cylinders, this should be the moment that a Juzam Jin appears. Of course, the Juzam is not great against that uh, Mishra's Factory there. I guess... Bjorn boarded some extra fact, uh, some extra mazes in. Sorry, I think it's at Mishra's Factory, but I mean Maze of If, of course. So Bjorn boarding in some extra mazes and boarding in the Whirling Dervish. Probably going to attack now. And I think, I wonder if Kuhn is going to use the Factory to try to block. If he does, it's quite risky because Bjorn has access, of course, to Disenchants and to Swords to Plowshares. And 
Kun is already quite low on land. He could take a hit one turn, I guess. Or is he going to take the risk? It looks like he's a little bit in the tank here. And of course, in response to the factory being animated, Bjorn can also use his mace. But look at that. There's a quick sword to plowshares. This is kind of what I feared already, this scenario. Because now Kun is losing a land. So he's going down to two lands. The Whirling Dervish is going to get a counter. So it's just... It's bad. And I think Bjorn is now getting a counter, by the way. So the Whirling Dervish is now going to be a 2-2. Oh, this is really bad news. He's going to untap. Hopefully he can at least find a land here. Scrub land would be quite nice. And then perhaps playing another sword, on a dervish or, or at least something. Just don't let it just be a pass. A balance will be quite good actually by now. Tapping two. Are we going to see a balance here? No, it's a Chaos Orb. So, I mean, Chaos Orb is good, but again, the problem is if Kun would have had a land drop here, he could have played Chaos Orb and activate the Chaos Orb, and Bjorn had his White Sword step, so he couldn't disenchant in response, so he could have taken care of the Whirling Dervish. Now he's got to take another hit of two, and that Whirling Dervish is going to go up again. It's going to tick up. It's now a 3-3, so it's pretty big. It's really getting out of hand. And again, it's hard to see the life total of Kun, but I believe... Yeah, he must be somewhere on 16. And this is a risk, you know, if Kun's going to flip right now, at least there's a land, by the way, there's a scrub land. If Kun's going to flip, he just has to hope, cross his fingers and hope that Bjorn doesn't have a disenchant in response. And I actually hope so too, Kun. I hope that he doesn't have a, have a disenchant. Uh, no, 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 ah, disenchant. Yeah, that when you're behind, you need you need momentum to kind of get back into it. And, and Kunis really doesn't have the momentum at the moment. I mean, he probably has to pass right now. That means that Bjorn can get another attack in. And that the Whirling Dervish is going to grow even further. Like an, a small Dervish, you can still block it on Factory. You know, if you source it, your opponent doesn't gain that much life. But this growing Dervish is going to be a big problem for Kun. I believe it's now a 3-3. And it's going to become a 4-4 after the attack. So there's the attack. It's going to take 3 points of damage. And it's going to drop to 13, I believe. And it's going to get a counter. So it's going to be a 4-4. And of course, this is, this is really nice for Bjorn. He can sit back. He can relax. He's ahead in the game. He doesn't have to play anything out. And I mean, Bjorn didn't draw great either. Because he doesn't really have any, any mana sources. If... Kun would have had a single early in the game. He could have taken care of the Savannah, and that would mean that Bjorn has no access to his Disenchance or Swords, and that would have made life so much easier for Kun. But yeah, he just has a lot of bad luck so far in this matchup. And there's that Soul Ring, but I mean, you don't really want to play a Juzum right now with those two Mazes of If. So maybe he's got a Juzum in hand, but he just doesn't want to play it. It looks like he is going to do something, though. Tapping three here. Okay, there's a balance. Okay, this is something at least. This is something. That means a Whirling Dervish is going to go and Bjorn is going to lose two lands. And that's going to be super interesting. What is he going to choose? Okay, there's a Disenchant on the Soaring. That makes sense. Two cards in hand for Bjorn. But at least this balance is going to give a little bit of breathing space. Oh, and look at that. He's going to throw away his mazes. That is risky. That is ballsy. And it's hard to see what Kun's putting in the graveyard there. I think I saw a white card, perhaps even the swords. Wow. And now Bjorn has to find lands. If Kun can now find a land and have a Juzam, that would be ideal. And there's a Mox Jet. Oh, are we going to see a Juzam? Okay, Hypnotic Spectre, maybe even better. Because that's going to force Bjorn to discard. And remember, Bjorn has already played out... Oh, or only one Swords, I think. Two Disenchants and the Swords. Yeah, only, only one sword. So there's still a pretty big chance that he has a Swords in hand here to deal with the Hippie. But I mean, this balance has kind of turned the tides. And now Kun kind of has a chance to come to get back into this. And that's, of course, what balance does. It equals the playing field. I believe 13 lives at the moment for Kuhn and 21 for Bjorn. 
And Bjorn really in the tank here. Trying to think, what can I do? And he's just passing the turn, I believe. Or asking how many cards are in hand of, uh, of Kuhn. So that means that next turn, hopefully Kuhn can attack and put some pressure on. And Bjorn really in the tank trying to find a solution. Okay, it looks like he's found a land. So are we going to see a land drop? No. Oh, there was a there was a Black Lotus into an Urnum. Oh, that is again unfortunate for Kuhn. You know, I just really feel he needs he needs a little bit of luck. And every time I say that, uh, he gets more unlucky. Anyway, at least dealing some damage. That means Bjorn's going to lose a card. He's going to lose a Disenchant. Who cares about that, really? And then he taps three more. Another Hypnotic Spectre. Okay, that's something. You know, he can take four. Go, go to nine. And then he can discard the entire hand of Bjorn. That would be quite nice. So there's the attacks. He's going to drop to nine. There's a Soul Ring. And there's a book, though. That is really good, that book. Oh, So uh, Bjorn here managing to empty his hand with the Soul Ring. Allowing him to cast that book. And there's the force walk granted to one of the flyers. There's a disenchant on the book. Okay, that's quite good. Problem here is that Kuhn's on nine, so he needs he can take damage for two more turns, and he's on one. This is a problem here. I mean, if you're Kuhn, I would just attack here, you know? I mean, you don't want to jump. It's going to drop him to 15 and pass. If Bjorn can now find one of his blue power cards, that would be amazing for him right now. Attacking for four, so he's going to drop to five. There's a factory, that's a problem. So that means that Kuhn needs to hold one of the Hypnotic Spectres back to block the incoming factory. There's a sword. Oh, nice! I said it before it came on the table because I was hoping for it. Swords to plowshares. Bjorn back to 19. Yeah, we just attack with one here, putting him on 17. And of course, keep one of the hippies at bay to potentially block the, uh, the factory. One card in hand here for Bjorn. And of course, Bjorn wants to play out that card because he knows he's going to lose it if, if not. You know, that's one of the great things about hippie as well. You're forcing your opponent to quickly play out his hand. Tapping three here. What are we going to see? Are we going to see an ice storm? There's a regrowth. Ooh, that is unfortunate. What is he going to get back? It went too quick. Was it the book, perhaps? He's going to attack with the other. He's going to attack with the tutor. No, it's not a book because he cannot play out the book. What did he get back? There's the attack with the tutor. He's going to block it. So he's going to lose it. So he's going to trade. Then there's a whirling dervish. Of course, that's actually a good move by Bjorn. Bjorn had to choose a card that he could play out the same turn because of the Hypnotic Spectre. There's the attack. Oh, there's a Suchi. Suchi coming in from the cyber probably took out his Juice Amps, put in the four Suchi, and this is great against that Whirling Dervish. This is great news. And I believe Bjorn is on 15, so he needs a lot of hits here. But at least he's got some breathing space attacking now. So Bjorn going to drop to 13. There's the pass. Are we going to see a disenchant here? Ooh, there's a balance. Yeah, probably going to take out the hippie here. What else can you do? So there's the balance. And he's not going to lose the Suchi, though. Only one creature because of the Whirling Dervish. And, of course, he's going to lose the card in hand, or cards in hand. It's hard to see. Two cards, I believe, he has to discard. A bit of an unfortunate angle here. So we cannot see everything that happens, but at least we've got a good view on the main playing field. 
And now both players are in top decking mode. And he's gonna tap three, so he's gonna take a damage. Gonna go to three. There's an Underworld Dreams. Put some pressure on, but he's so low. Bjorn going to 12. Tapping. There's an Urnum. Oh, and that Urnum is great against the Suchi. Oh, man. And that means next turn, if Bjorn attacks, Kuhn has to block the Urnum or else he dies, which is devastating for him. He needs a sword. So, okay, at least another Suchi. It's going to go to two. Okay, so next turn, he can double block. <laughs> <laughs> the, the earn him if Bjorn attacks, and then he will go to one. Oh, man. But if if he now top decks something to deal with one of the two creatures. Okay, he's going to take a damage. He's going to go to 11. Oh, more threats. Oh, there's an icy manipulator. Oh, this is so bad for him. He's on 11. He can use the city to tap a Suchi. He would go to 10. Probably the best way to, the best thing to do now is just to wait, to be honest. Or is it to, to tap a Suchi, go to 10, attack with both? That's probably best, because then he has to block one. He's gonna lose he's gonna lose a Suchi, he's gonna go to one life. That is probably the best scenario here. So for Bjorn. And of course he's he's going through all these different scenarios in his head, but I think the best thing to do here is use your IC on one of the two Suchis, attack with both your creatures. Remember, Kun is on two, so he has to block. He's gonna go to 10, exactly. Block the Suchi, attack with both. Kuhn has to block. Now he's going to go to one. Oh, man. It looks like it's the end of the road for Kuhn here. Oh, man. I mean, if he can get a swords, no. But then even yeah, even with the swords, he's not helped. Because of that icy manipulator, that's a big problem. There's Hypnotic Spectre. Yeah, next turn, exactly. That's it. Because Bjorn can next turn tap one of his two creatures, attack with both, and win the game. And he's won the match right here. And... Wow, I mean, I have to give compliments to Kuhn for, you know, keep fighting and finding that balance. And then uh, and then Bjorn also found the balance later in the game. But this actually, this, this game too turned out to be way more exciting than I thought uh, at the start of the game too, because it was uh, quite a slow start for Kuhn. Anyway, congratulations to Bjorn for winning. And uh, what's maybe nice to say is that Bjorn also ended up winning the tournament. Unfortunately, I don't have the finals, but this is the winning deck of the Camel Trophy 2022. So a big thumbs up and congratulations to Bjorn for uh, yeah, winning your own tournament, Bjorn. I think it's the first time, so congratulations for that. And if you enjoyed this tournament, please let me know in the comments below because it's always nice to read and um, don't forget to like this video it's just a simple thumbs up click but it really helps the channel move forward and if you're new to the channel welcome to old school magic please consider to subscribe and ring that bell and then there's one more thing i'd like to share with you before you go and that is the timmy talks patreon page because yes we have a patreon page and by the patreon.com slash timmy talks you can uh, become a patron of the channel and you can support Timmy Talks starting with $1 a month. And the cool thing is if you join the Patreon program, you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord, the Timmy Talks tournaments, and of course you are supporting the channel. So, I mean, what more can you ask for, right? And then all that for just $1 a month. And on top of that, your name will also be mentioned in at the end scroll at the end of every single video. What end scroll? This end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Somebody can see.